want to talk about today is a life well spent. Well spent. Economic language. Now, nobody would mistake me for being financially astute. Susie Orman, I am not. I grew up basically outside the monetary economy, in subsistence farming. You know what subsistence farming is? It's where you barely have enough crops that you get on into the financial exchange to buy the things you need. But basically live kind of in, you know, planting your own crops, raising your own cattle, raising your own garden. My family had a 10-acre garden and a small orchard, etc. I've had to learn, because of that background, to really navigate two economic sensibilities as I came into my adult life. This is the first economic sensibility that I grew up with. On a December morning in rural Minnesota, my mother would awaken us kids to witness the flaming orange to purple sunrise with these words. Look, she'd say, the angels are firing the ovens in the heavens to bake Christmas cookies. <laughs> It's the first economy that I grew up in. Her metaphoric language spoke to the human spirit's delight in nature's beauty. Around the dinner table, our family traded such accounts. That's what happened over the dinner table. We'd say, do you see the box over in the North 40 today? How about that red gem of a strawberry laying on the golden straw? That hawk riding the log to the wind? The fire of Sunak stands in autumn. Exchanging such accounts, we, though subsistence farmers, counted ourselves as rich. We did. We thought we had the most magnificent life because we had access to this on a daily basis. Admittedly, even at the time of the 1960s to 70s, that's not how my family was seen by others around us. Even other farmers who, during those years, were buying and stitching quarter section to quarter section, creating large spreads of land. Even in their eyes, we were the poor of the community. But here, my point is this. In some ways, Christian life situates each of us between two economies. In the same way that I had to grow up and navigate that world wonderment, and then how another valuation of life the, by the fiscal economy saw us. I think Christian life is like that. It situates us between two economies, between that of spirit and that of the fiscal economy. It's in that vein that I want today to talk with you about economics, about a life well spent. I want to start with something of a prayerful poem from that nature mystic Mary Oliver. Have you, any of you heard of Mary Oliver's poems? Yeah. She's a wonderful writer, and I encourage you to grab a hold of her work. So if you will, listen and pray with me as I, I read to you one of her poems. This is called The Summer Day. It is May 1. We're waking to summer. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. This one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who's gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know what a prayer is, but I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down in the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. <clears throat> Tell me, what else should I have done doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and very precious life? Most Christians will not recognize that the term economy has a theological origin. It started out as a theological term. In Christian theological 
biological history, economy first named the way in which God's love circulated through the cosmos so as to save life, or better, so as to occasion the flourishing of life. That notion of God's life-giving love came down to most of us instead in the theological concept incarnation. That term you know, right? You've heard that term in the church. But economy, too, is our term. It was the Greek version of the Latin term, incarnation. Whereas Christians have come all too easily to categorically sum up incarnation by talking about the life of Jesus, thinking instead back with the Greek term economy as a theological category, as a theological term, may help us, I want to suggest, find our way within this economic transition time in our culture. So the divine economy names the work of incarnating and circulating love as justice, generosity, compassion, infinite mercy. For Christians, money, the fiscal economy, takes its bearing from that overriding concern, from the concern, from our call to circulate love unbounded, to circulate infinite mercy, to circulate compassion. So fiscal economy, that economy, takes its bearing from this other economy of wonderment, of love circulating as the arteries of, of cosmic life. Incarnating the divine economy is our practice, ours to do. It's not all been done already. There are sometimes two blocks that get in our way from thinking about circulating the divine economy as our practice. The first block is that we tend to think of spiritual life as interiority. It happens in here. It happens between me and Jesus, not out here in the world. No, I want to tell you that spiritual practice, being out here with our values, is our work to do. This is where spiritual life happens, between us, among us, on the city streets, how we manage agriculture and forest. Secondly, sometimes we've then thought also about Christianity as belief, and we put belief up here in the head. And we think that if it's satisfied up here, then we're done with the work. I want to rather encourage you to think about the spiritual life as faithfulness. You know, God came, God showed us how to love the world. That's what God's work is. We're called to be faithful to that work, to love the world. So our faith gets out there in the world. Belief isn't to be stuck up here. It's to be taking to the path out here with God, who is so in love with the world. So incarnating the divine economy is our work to do. But when we let that sentiment, that notion, settle into our bones, as the economics to which Christianity calls us in daily life, we can begin to understand why religions can be said to be culturally uncomfortable. Religions are to make us serene and placid. No, they kind of ruffle our feathers a little bit, get us uncomfortable with the way life is happening around us. Religions situate us agonistically between these two economies. We have to wrestle between these two lives of value that we're taught. The one that is culturally available and the divine economy. And that makes spiritual life a little bit more like Jacob wrestling the angel by night than sitting and contemplating. In the first part of my presentation today, I want simply to help us get a sense of these two economies between which our lives as religious persons take place. To get a sense of how the person religious wrestles between these two systems of value, both of which address the same world. So I will be, in opening, simply elaborating the two economies between which religious persons live, 
the fiscal economy, which is today the globalization of the free, of free market capitalization, and then secondly, the divine economy. So I want to start by talking about the fiscal economy and giving you a theologically motivated critique of the fiscal 